Well, welcome to the Mercantile Lofts. We're happy you're here. Historic Hamilton is um, proud to have a panel discussion on reviving our historic district neighborhoods. Here at the Mercantile, if you are not familiar with our project, we have 29 residential apartments. And right now, um, 28 of them are filled, and the 29th one will be occupied in December. It was occupied up until a month ago, so we're turning that apartment over. So if you're interested in becoming a member of Historic Hamilton, we have membership brochures on your seat, and we would love to have you. Um, to give us a little bit of more information about the history of Historic Hamilton, I'd like to ask Dave Blue to come and speak for a few minutes. It's always fun to talk about Historic Hamilton because it's a very special organization. Uh, we're a small organization and we're sort of low profile, but I'm here to tell you tonight that we have had some major influence and impact upon this community. It was started in 1979 as an umbrella organization for the city's historic districts. We have an ongoing interest in preserving and restoring. I would like to take a few minutes to share some of our achievements. The restoration of the Captain John Cleve Sims Monument in Sims Park. Now, I'm sure some of you don't know where Sims Park is. It's on South Third Street across from Colligan Funeral Home. And the monument's in the center of that. We sponsor the historical plaque to honor native author William Dean Howes. We cooperated in the nomination of the Butler County Courthouse for inclusion on the National Registry of Historic Places. We gave support to the original Main Street program. Historic Hamilton was a force behind the revitalization of the Farmer's Market on Courthouse Square. We provided funds and leadership, and uh, Fred Banker was one of the early leaders and <coughs> Bob Sherman and John Vaughn, they have steered it to its present success. And if you've noticed the last couple of years, there are vendors on all four sides. It's, it's completely transformed and growing, and very successful. Our organization led the charge to finally recognize our city's namesake. The idea for an Alexander Hamilton statue came from our group. And uh, we also provided leadership in the financial campaign to make this wonderful landmark sculpture possible. Historic Hamilton played a major role in assuring that the new High Street Main Street Bridge would have significant historical elements. We suggested that medallions be placed on the railings on the bridge in our Board member at that time, historian Jim Blunt, came up with the ideas for the medallions, he wrote the scripts, and the rest is history. We encouraged the establishment of Harry's Hall in the McCloskey Museum, which opened in 2006. Recently, we contributed to the new monument sign and bronze plaque in front of the Mueller building. And if you haven't seen it, stop. It's, it's, it's very beautiful uh, landmark. And we led the effort to secure, <clears throat> preserve, and restore the log cabin in Monument Park. And currently, we are involved in the preservation and restoration of the historic Crawford House in Crawford Woods. We are proud to be a, a partner in the efforts to preserve and recognize this city's rich history and in helping to move the city forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Well, I'd like to introduce our panelists for this evening. Um, first is Jane Jacobs, down on the end. Jane's a very active and longtime resident of the Rossville Historic District, as well as an avid gardener who's gardened her way up and down South D Street. She and her husband, Monty, have recently turned their efforts to renovation of dilapidated projects on Houston Street, 
They've completed their first house, they have it rented, and they're hard at work on their next project at the corner of Franklin and Houston. Jane's tagline is, Houston, we have a problem, and Jane and Bonnie are working hard to solve that problem. So thank you, Jane. Brandon Sarver is uh, next. Brandon is the assistant to the city manager here in Hamilton. He's a multi-generational Hamiltonian. He was born and raised in Lindenwald, where he's lived with his wife, Chrissy, and two children. Brandon is uh, the city administration's point person to the Sense of Place Committee of Council and has been working on Hamilton's Neighborhoods Initiative. He's currently renovating a historic house in German Village, where he hopes to be a part of the budding urban renaissance of Hamilton City Center. Thanks, Brandon. James Brown is our next panelist, and James moved to the area in 2005 <coughs> from Indianapolis. His wife, Melissa, is from Cincinnati, and while looking for a new home, they fell in love with the charm of Lindenwald and the history of Hamilton. Their daughter, Sophie, was born in 2008, and James says he began to see Hamilton through her eyes. Wanting to do more, he attended a sense of place meeting in 2011, and along with Frank Downey, accepted the task of being the co-chair of PROTOCOL, which stands for People Reaching Out to Others, Celebrate Our Lindenwald. James says that even though Indy will always be his hometown, Hamilton will always be his home. Liz Colombo, now Hayden, um, is a business development specialist with the city of Hamilton. She's been living and working in Hamilton for one and a half years. After residing here at the Mercantile Lofts, she and her husband Danny recently bought a home in the Rossville Historic District. Liz was drawn to Hamilton because of his, his, its historic urban charm, and she loves participating in revitalization efforts to enhance these assets and increase Hamilton's economic viability. And our fifth panelist is not a stranger to us, our city manager, Joshua Smith. He has the unique perspective of having lived in both suburban and urban Hamilton within his three plus tenure with the city. He's a strong advocate for Hamilton's urban core and traditional neighborhoods and decided to walk the walk last year when he renovated and made his home in an 1850s house in German Village. And our last panelist is Bob Sherwin, who is certainly no stranger to us um, in the historic renovation field. Bob is the current vice president of Historic Hamilton and a professor emeritus in sociology and anthropology with Miami University. He partnered with preservationist Sherry Corbett in Corbett Sherwin Renovations, and they have restored 17 properties in what is now the Dayton Lane Historic District, where he currently lives in the historic McKinney House. And our moderator tonight is a good friend of mine, my husband, Mike Dingledine. <laughs> Mike is an architect um, at Community Design Alliance, an architecture and design firm that focuses on Hamilton's ongoing revitalization efforts. And we have our storefront offices here in the Mercantile Loft Building. Mike's also the executive director of the Hamilton Core Fund. That stands for the Consortium for Ongoing Reinvestment Efforts. He lives uh, with our daughters and myself in the Rossville Historic District in a historic home designed by Frederick Mueller, Hamilton's architect in 1906. So without further ado, Mike, can you kick us off? Um, I thought I would do a very quick uh, sort of photographic tour of our uh, historic residential districts, to sort of give you an architect's perspective of that quickly and maybe give the panelists a little bit of uh, food for thought to get them started um, as they start talking. Um, I'm going to deal with our National Register of Historic Districts because that was really the umbrella or the organization that this um, Historic Hamilton became the umbrella of. These are all registered with the National Historic Register Districts. We have German Village first uh, and then uh, Rossville and then Dayton Lane. Um, not by age and in fact uh, Dayton Lane is much older than Rossville from a, a, a age perspective, but that was the age at which they were um, brought into an historic district status. First, we have German Village, our oldest residential district in Hamilton. Uh, fantastic area. It was really um, marked by the German immigrants that came to Hamilton who were working in our new industrial uh, plants. Uh, people like Rudolf Thiem, who was the uh, designer of the state stoves and ultimately became the artist who did uh, Billy Yank. Uh, but the houses you see in German Village from the older era, um, it, was a, it was an era of do things very, very well with high craftsmanship, but be very modest about quantity and size. The number of bricks, you know, cost money. 
The height to ceilings cost money. Uh, so the oldest houses in German Village, you, you'll see a, a very modest sense of scale, but what you will see is a fabulous control of human scale. The windows fit the size of the facade. The cornice is exactly sized so that the vertical wall and the slope roof work well together. And so as you see these old houses, they just have wonderful scale and wonderful style. Their distance from the street is no accident. It was perfect for the scale of the house, uh, and they lined themselves up. As we entered the 19th century, or the 20th century, in the early 1900s, uh, the wealth of the industrial Hamilton was starting to become uh, more, um, more obvious, and we started to grow these houses. And so you'll see, uh, especially on 2nd Street, uh, we got taller, we got bigger windows, we got larger cornices, but still, the control of scale was fantastic. Everything matches. Uh, Lane Hooven House comes to mind, not only because of this, the philanthropists and the industrialists who built it, but uh, its unique character. Uh, there aren't too many octagonal houses uh, that are so well designed. And again, when you look at scale, uh, the cornice here, massive, giant woodwork, but because of the scale of the house, it had to be that way for that to work, and it works perfectly. Windows, 11, 12 feet tall, uh, but go all the way to the ground because this was a perfectly uh, ventilated house in the era that it was built so that it, it used natural ventilation as its method of work. Uh, again, the ornateness of the details, what you'll always notice if you look at good houses is everything works together, everything scales. Benny Hoffen House, now our historic society. Again, a, a masterful house in terms of scale and control. Detail is wonderful, more Victorian now than when we were looking at houses in the mid-1800s. Mid There's fantastic details all over the district. Uh, and thanks to a handful of people, um, our historic districts uh, could have been extinct by now. A lot of cities have lost theirs. Uh, but for Hamilton, a handful of people, uh, especially some significant people like Bill Wilkes when it comes to German Village, and Bob and Sherry when it comes to Dayton Lane, uh, did a wonderful job in moving us forward in a, in a great accelerated way in terms of getting everybody interested in preservation. And that's why these districts became historic districts. Uh, what German Village has going for it is a huge open slate here at River's Edge, the rest of this park, uh, to be developed. It's a fantastic way to connect this, di this district to the city. Uh, and it makes German Village a bit unique because it is so intimately connected to downtown. Uh, the other two districts are separated, one by a river and the other by a railroad track. So moving on to Rossville, where we live. Um, a little bit newer, there were older houses in the first couple blocks off of Ross Avenue, but as you get further up the street, my house was past the turn of the century, and then houses all the way up in Crescent were in the uh, late teens and 20s. So it's a much newer district from the standpoint of when the houses uh, came to pass here. Great scale and great differences. This is Frederick Mueller's house that he built for his wife when they got married. Um, and you can see the children's home, now the father's house to the left there. Fantastic again. What I love about this house and what I love about Frederick Mullen, everyone knows I've talked about him ad nauseum, uh, is again the, the fabulous control of scale. Nobody put a, a cornice that heavy on a building. Nobody ran windows to those scales. Nobody did things that made the house read from very close to very far away in terms of scale. When you look at the details, uh, people just weren't even thinking about this kind of thing uh, when they were building houses, and he started doing that. Uh, fa fantastic diversity in Rossville. Totally different styles next to each other and not a problem in the world because they all, again, in individually work very well amongst themselves and collectively look very diverse and make, look at that, three completely different styles of architecture in one half block. Classical details came from his, uh, this is Frederick Mueller as well, came from his training uh, at the Armour School of Architecture and Design. Uh, Tudor houses, totally eclectic, sort of turn of the century houses, craftsman style. Um, just fantastic work, fantastic diversity again. And they sit on old sites that today obviously are very mature and very well um, built and very well grown around these houses who have all been here for more than 100 years. Just a fantastic setting for a neighborhood. <clears throat> again, why I'm showing all these images is there's not one house that looks like the next house. They all have their own unique style and character. Uh, and that is fantastic for a neighborhood. And then Dayton Campbell District, um, the oldest, well, some of the oldest large houses in Hamilton, uh, but with the last of the three districts to be formed. Um, uh, George Adam Renshaw's house, um, I don't have a picture, Bob, of when Sherry bought it, but it was boarded up and falling apart. Uh, and you would have thought that this district was on its last legs. And of course, we all know the story since then. She turned this house around and then proceeded to do that for the rest of the neighborhood. And so um, this was a fantastic house. Again, 
uh, a very modest house in the turn of the century, but when George Adam Renster bought it, he hired Frederick Mueller, one of his very first commissions, and he more than doubled the size of the house. And I'll come back to that topic in a minute. Christian Benninghoffen's house, these were the actual uh, industrial uh, wealthy, uh, industrial barons of Hamilton on this street. This was the place. If you had a millionaire's row in Hamilton, it was, it was Dayton Lane. McKinney House. Uh, Robert McKinney was the president of Niles Tool Works, the largest tool and die company in the planet Earth at the time. Wow. And you can see the houses reflected that, the Bender House. And again, great, um, great um, soaring kind of decisions architecturally and all different and all unique. Uh, it's just fantastic. See some more Frederick Mueller's details. You can tell this house is right away because of this just amazing control of his, of his edges and terminations and transitions. Again, that Modillion concept that you see all over the city, that was all him. So next to each other, they have nothing to do with each other architecturally or stylishly, but because they're in a woven neighborhood uh, of all the same setbacks, the different architecture actually uh, makes these houses fantastic because they're all unique. taking pictures of details that you'll find no place else. Uh, to get our panel started, I want to just talk about three kind of takeaways that will, um, I think, that I find as an architect and as a, as a resident of these historic pictures, I think that give them their greatest value. The first is something we cannot replicate and no one has ever successfully done it, although the new urbanists are trying. There is a scale, a human scale about these neighborhoods that is fantastic. Uh, we think it's too modest, we think it's too um, invasive of our privacy, we think it's too invasive of being a private property, land bearing in a country manor estate, but having houses five feet from the street edge and no feet from the sidewalk is just something that gives this street a sense of this is place humans want to be. Uh, the scale of this street, the enclosure of it is fantastic. When you walk on a street like this, you don't sense it, or you do sense it, but you don't know why you sense it. It's just this is a place that's comfortable to be. It's not uncomfortable because you're two feet away from your neighbors. It's not uncomfortable because you're two feet away from the street. It's comfortable because the scale of this outdoor space fits with humans. And we can't replicate that as hard as we try because we think bigger and better and more is better. Uh, and we don't want to replicate that. This was one of the wealthiest people in Hamilton, Ohio. Look at the distance his house is from the edge of the street. Look at the scale uh, as you walk here. The trees protect you, the fence protects you, the house creates a wall that you're walking against, but it all feels comfortable to humans. And it's a great place to be. And that's why these neighborhoods feel so good to us. It's not just the diverse architecture, it's the scale of these neighborhoods that's fantastic. And so in all three of them and all the other neighborhoods, even Lindenwall and Highland Park do a great job of this. Uh, it's when we got past the 50s and the post-war boom that we kind of lost our way in terms of human scale. That's a lecture all of its own. <laughs> but look at the vista. You can see a long way here, all the way across Third Street, uh, but yet you feel like the fence, the trees, the scale of the sidewalk, everything works for humans. Uh, we knew how to do that, and we knew that it felt good, and we always did it. And then when we lost it, we didn't know what we lost, and we forgot. Same thing in Rossville here, <laughs> the character of the street from the edge, the character of the houses. Look how nice and grand they are, yet how close to the street they are, and how they form a great relationship between house, sidewalk, street. Lots of porches. We wanted to be social people. We still do, but we don't think that way when we build houses. Look at that, fantastic human space right there. Just makes you want to walk there every day. Even in, on the high street side of Dayton Lane, this works pretty well. The buildings hug the, the sidewalk. The sidewalk is nice and wide, and, but it's hugged nicely to the street. You go, and even down here, these buildings are old and tired, but the scale of a human being walking on this sidewalk works. You go across the street and it's totally lost. We put cars first, pedestrian second, and we lost every sense of scale that we had. Same thing on Main Street. Completely lost what we had. The second big idea is there is no historic snapshot of buildings that matters. Uh, this house was not the original house that was built here, and thanks to Bob, who found this fantastic picture. Uh, this was Sherry Corbett's house before uh, Adam Rensselaer bought it, um, and it was blown up into a much larger house. It was a sister house, actually, to the house next door. Uh, and so some people might say, if you're going to restore a house, what do you do? Where do you go back? The point is these houses and these neighborhoods have changed forever and there is no one perfect time. 
There might be a dominant style in the neighborhood, but there certainly aren't in the Art Hamilton Historic District. <laughs> so this is kind of what Sherry's house looked like when the Rentschlers bought it. Um, and this is what uh, Frederick Mueller did to it. He blew it up to a much larger house. Still worked very well, still was very balanced, but it's very different. And today, it's very different. And so I guess my takeaway is there isn't, uh, in my mind, a mandatory sense of what you should do to a house. Is they should always be done well. They shouldn't have to be done to any particular time period. The whole city of Hamilton is filled with different houses at different time periods. And so as you look at a house, this is where Marge Blue grew up, the porch used to wrap around the house. I wish it still did, but it doesn't today. And the question is, what is it, what is it responsible of the next tenant or the next owner who wants to be historic with a house like this to do? And I think it's wide open. It's an open palette. As long as it's done well, it should be allowed to be, to be done. These certainly weren't the columns that were originally on this house. Um, they don't belong. Um, but again, it's, way that, it's the way it is now. So what's the responsibility of the current and future owners of these properties uh, to think about what they want to do? I think they should do it well. This was a carriage house uh, to a much larger house, and the Reisters have turned it into a fabulous home all of its own uh, by doing some very nice contextual additions to it. This was Sam Fitton's house on 3rd Street in German Village. Uh, very grand house, very fantastic house. Uh, today it's lost most of its character because most of its details have been taken away. Uh, but it's a house that, again, what, what, what's the future of this house? What should we do with it next? I don't think it has to go back to being this, but I think it has a better future than the condition it's in now. Uh, everyone, it took me a while to recognize this house when I saw this picture because I knew it looked familiar, but I couldn't figure out why it looked familiar, <laughs> yet I couldn't place it. It's because it lost some of its addition. Uh, again, it's still a very nice building of its own. Uh, should we put that back? It might be interesting. I certainly like that version <laughs> of the house. Uh, but today it's this. And that's, yeah, well, it's now sold. Uh, and this brings me to the biggest point. I don't know if this should be our topic tonight, but this is our greatest risk of our historic districts in our, our core of our <coughs> urban areas. And that's something I call demolition by neglect. Um, these houses tend to, to sit in neutral. They tend to be abandoned. They tend to be held by people who have no interest in putting money in them. And that seems like that's a neutral proposition, but it's not. Uh, this is a fabulous house. Look at the 18 inches of solid mahogany there in the door jam. But it's, it's about gone, and it doesn't take long. Warren Klink once said it takes about 10 years to abandon a building before nature would take it over and absorb it right back into the ground. And if anyone's been in Detroit late, lately, you would know that that's true. Uh, our buildings are at great risk of going, going away if we don't manage this. And this is what, that's inside of this building that's on 3rd Street. Fantastic house, great scale, great grandeur, but it's within a few years of being totally lost. Uh, and that goes on in a lot of places. And it goes on sometimes in a huge way like this house, but sometimes just in a small way. Uh, and eventually, sitting on the design review board, houses like this come before us, and we're told by the owners in the city that they're useless, and they're now a risk, and now they have to go away. And that's really unfortunate, because we cannot possibly replace the quality of that construction under today's economic terms. And so it would be fantastic if we could get ahead of this. And that's one of the things the core fund is trying to do, uh, is save some of our strategic properties and try to restore them just to wait, if we have to, to find the place where they enter back into the stream of economic use uh, and find ways to save them. Uh, these, are, these are cool buildings. And again, I think, uh, don't blame the people who tell me they're dangerous and need to come down. I blame the people who let them get that way. Uh, and it's incumbent upon us as neighbors to sort of move this forward. Uh, even Sherry's house uh, is in need of some drastic um, maintenance in terms of gutters and envelope. And you can imagine all the work and love she put into this house. And in a matter of 10 years, um, it is at risk again. Uh, and we need to deal with those kinds of things. Same, I have the same thought, Bob. <laughs> Don't know what the word is, but uh, it's too bad. This is a house on North uh, C Street. It was built in the same area as my house by the same architect. Very similar building. Uh, it is within a year or two of being totally gone. Um, the brick walls will stand, but everything inside the building that's wood and everything outside the building that's wood is just about to be gone. Um, and it's really tragic. And then finally, my final thought is uh, something that's been gone for the last 50 years in Hamilton is downtown living. Uh, that's certainly come back with the mercantile building. We're in it, and we have a full building full of places. I do believe there's going to be a lot more of this coming uh, online. And so we can take our three core historic neighborhoods and we can add the fourth one. And I think if we go out a couple miles, we can add a lot more neighborhoods in the city that rise to the level of quality. Uh, this just happens to be an opportunity. And again, historically, this was never intended to be residential. 
So the historicists might argue with me that this isn't appropriate. I would argue this is very appropriate, and obviously the market agrees with me as we have a full building here. So, very cool stuff. I took people through this building and they said, no one will ever live here. You're full of crap if you think this is going to work. No one will ever want to live in downtown Hamilton. As we defined and discovered more and more about this building and got it this way, um, we found out differently. So I'll open it up to my panel now, and I'll let them talk, and again, I don't care if they want to talk about uh, the, the things they love about historic districts, the things they think are the most important for us to think about. Uh, everyone here on this panel is, uh, is both a pioneer or a long-term supporter of, of our urban historic living, and I think this room is full of, uh, of raving fans, but maybe we can learn from each other tonight just ways that we can help each other. Come on, Joshua, you, you just bought a house in German Village. Tell us why you did that. Well, if I would have <clears throat> known that uh, Bob had that awesome Green Bay Packer jacket he wore in tonight, I would have bought a house in Dayton Lane instead. But um, us Packer fans are few and far between here in Hamilton, Ohio. We need to stick together. But um, a German Village for me was a, a very easy decision. And what made it easier um, goes back to the investment by the Hamilton Community Foundation and the Marriott um, and the cities and the foundation's investment, along with the private investment in the building that we're all sitting in right now. Um, seeing that that investment was happening in this area, being downtown is, um, from a downtown living perspective, is something that's very comfortable. I love walking out my front door and looking, looking at Billy Yank, seeing the river, looking right across at River's Edge, to have all those amenities within walking distance, and just merely not having to get into my car in the morning and driving to work because I can walk, uh, is everything I've always wanted. I, I remember growing up as a child, my dad worked in New York City, and it literally would take a train, a subway, and still about a 14 block walk before he got to his office, and I can do it in six easy blocks. Who else has a thought? Let me just think of some questions. Um, what intimidates people, and you guys are obviously not the intimidated ones, but what do you think intimidates people to take on either good quality housing stock in old neighborhoods or the ones that need all that sort of retrofit and tender loving care and sort of the weekend warrior kind of work? What is it that has taken so long for people to see the value in that? Because some of you guys are, are taking on huge and intimidating projects, and I would just wonder uh, what's made you get over the hump in terms of doing that kind of thing? Well, um, Monty, my husband's grandma had a saying yard by yard the job is hard and inch by inch the job's a cinch. So that's what I think every day when I'm working on my projects. And um, and it, it, when you take it a tiny step at a time, it really doesn't seem like a big project. And I, um, one thing that I think in, I, because Monty and I bought these properties to use as rental properties, but we're making them nice enough that we would live in them ourselves. And I keep hearing from people, oh my gosh, you're gonna be a landlord, that's gonna be a nightmare, it's a, just horrible. And I keep thinking, well, the most of the people I know that tell me that are running a slum, basically, and they feel, you know, so they have um, problems with tenants and that sort of thing, but I think what you're telling me is that your tenant is not respecting your slum that you're running, so not really surprised. So we thought we would try to make it really nice and maybe have a higher quality renter and maybe better experience. Bob, why did Sherry think that this was the thing to do? Because I remember people laughing at her too, saying she was nuts. Well, I'll tell you about that. <laughs> Sherry was not born an ardent preservationist. When she came here in 1976 to take a position in the sociology and anthropology department at Miami, she moved here from a trailer in Tulsa, Oklahoma that had been her home while she was in graduate school. She had no idea. But she ended up renting an apartment in a very old Victorian house in Oxford. And she was amazed. It just blew her away. She said, wow, isn't this neat? And so she developed this kind of interest in things that were old and things that had value as being old. And so she began by collecting antiques 
And so she would parade around southwestern Ohio and go to various antique shows and to various antique malls. And she met people and asked questions. And she bought a bedroom set and she learned how to strip it and restore it. She says, wow, isn't that neat? It's resurrection. And uh, then she got the idea, I think I would like to do this. I would like to live in such a home like, like the one I'm living in now in Oxford. So she looked around Oxford and everything was way too expensive for her. She was a beginning assistant professor. Her salary was not very much. So she by then had made a number of friends and one of them was a man by the name of John O'Raden who was an antique dealer in Fairhaven, Ohio and used to roam all over the country. And he's the one that told her, he said, well, you can't afford anything in Oxford, but I know a person who's got a home for sale in Hamilton, Ohio. And she came here and she saw that place and fell in love with it and uh, decided she wanted to buy it. So uh, she didn't have any money and she didn't have decent credit. Uh, so uh, she tried a couple of places and they said, no, uh, we can't uh, uh, afford to offer you a mortgage. Thank heavens for Wally Mayer of Columbia Federal. Wally Mayer took a chance on her and loaned her the money and then she borrowed as much money as she could from other people to start these projects. Uh, and her goal was to finish an apartment. She knew she wanted to take that house and subdivide it into apartments, keeping the lion's share of the stuff in, uh, for herself. And then as soon as she got one of those uh, ready, she could rent it and that would be additional income to help pay that mortgage, help pay for some more restoration. She knew nothing. She had no idea what she was getting into, but she was energetic, uh, she was enthusiastic, and she asked a lot of questions. She was a firebrand, and so she, she attracted people. She became like a beacon. People began to gravitate to her, to offer her advice, to give her suggestions, and craftsmen, for example, who didn't like to work in old houses because they were such a pain in the, in, in the, in the butt, uh, were suddenly developing an interest in saying, okay, how can we get this done without destroying the structural integrity of this building? And we learned how to, instead of tear down walls so we could easily re rewire them, we learned how to fish from one floor to another, uh, which is always much more difficult, but at least it, it, it keeps you from having to bust through the walls and it protects the lath too, which was a very important thing uh, for her. And she found plumbers uh, who were willing to learn how to hang, how to hang hanging bat, uh, johns and pawfoot tubs uh, that she developed this kind of passion for. And she was a kind of like a magnetic attraction. She attracted people uh, uh, to help her, to work for her. I came to, shortly after she bought uh, 643 Dayton, I came to take her out to dinner. And she wasn't ready. She was in that widow's, that, that suitor's bench area, and, and she was stripping some of the woodwork. So I waited patiently till she was done, and she said, after a while, she said, well, while we're waiting, why don't you help me? <laughs> so I ended up uh, stripping, that, uh, there's a lion's head uh, that has a special uh, place in my heart. I stripped that lion's head. We never did go out to dinner. We ordered in a pizza and we stripped uh, most of the evening. And suddenly I had that same kind of thing. Uh, and she had this unique ability to attract people with, because she could not only then she not only wanted to learn about it, she wanted to do it too. She didn't want to be the supreme commander who ordered people what to do. She was right in the, pic in, in the middle of it. I've got some pictures of some of the stuff over there, <coughs> before and after. And each project we took on became more and more onerous. And as we, we learned, for example, uh, to uh, uh, hang drywall, we learned how to shingle roofs, we learned how to build or repair box gutters. Uh, we learned how to paint buildings. She develops this passion for painted ladies. 
We went to a conference once in San Francisco, and after we delivered our paper, uh, we spent the rest of the day and a half wandering through those painted ladies' districts, and she was taking pictures, and she even bought a book uh, of the painted ladies so she could you know, develop color schemes. She loved to do that kind of stuff. And she, not only should she talk the talk then, but she walked the walk as well. And uh, we, as, as Mike, I think, suggested, during our time together, we uh, restored 17 properties, which comprised a total of 42 rental units. Amazing achievement. And it was all due to her. And, and why not stop after you finish the George Adam Rentschler's house? I mean, why, why did, what was the reason to keep going? It wasn't financial, because she basically created as much new debt as she created new income. She didn't care. She wasn't scared of the risk, but she, she wasn't creating a, a financial empire. She was just Absolutely. doing what she wanted. We, we used to take walks down Campbell Avenue. She loved Campbell Avenue. And we would walk past what is 810 Campbell Avenue now. It used to be the home of a lady by the name of Stevenson. And she was related to the guy who used to have the modern age brewery out on 127, where they have a plastics factory now. And uh, we would walk by and we'd notice the plants in the window slowly dying. And we knew then that she probably wasn't there anymore. And finally, her son called us and he said, my gosh, my mother's in a nursing home and she's probably not going to come out of there. And I'm wondering if you guys would be interested in buying this house. I've been seeing what you've been doing with your house. He said, I don't want to put it on the market. It's, it's an abomination. And so we looked at it and bought it. And then we were off to the races. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's the way it went. It's the most exciting thing I've done. I loved it as much as I love teaching, which is about as much as I can love anything. Uh, and uh, it's, it's wearing and tearing, uh, but exhilarating as well. And I loved it, and so did she. I'll Go ahead. Say, okay. Bob was talking about fishing through walls, and I'll just talk about my experience, and we didn't have to do that. But <laughs> over the course of the past year, we looked at a lot of historic houses in Rossville and Dayton Lane and German Village. And uh, I, I would always take my dad along. He's a contractor. And he'd just give me this look, you know, halfway through the tour of the place. And just, you know, what are you getting me into? Um, so we finally looked at this place that had been already virtually deconstructed down to the studs. And I'm, I'm waiting for that same look. And he goes, I love it. I know what's behind the walls. <laughs> Everything's there. So uh, that, that kind of brought that up in my mind when Bob was talking about fishing wires through walls. I'm, I'm glad we didn't have to do that. What's the risk reward? I mean, the risk is huge. You have a young family. You're moving into um, a district that has more uh, tenants, uh, owner, you know, renters than it has owner occupiers. Um, you, you have a, hu a huge house to manage. Um, so there's financial risk for you. What's the reward that makes you so excited about it? Because both, I look at you and your wife, and you're both so totally excited about this giant project that's sitting in front of you. Well, we we, we say we won't get excited it. until it's done. But, um, <laughs> what we keep saying to each other and to ourselves is, if not us, who? And if not now, when? And that's, that's, a, that's a big motivation for us. Because we, my first meeting I think I had as a city employee was at the German Village Association. And I told that group, I said, I said, I, I really believe this should be our it neighborhood. It's, it's great. It's small. It's manageable. Right next to downtown and uh, right on the river. This, this is really great. There's some great opportunities here. And uh, I said, one day I'm going to live here. And I still hope that day's coming. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Liz, what are your generation? I mean, what do you think more of your generation is looking for these kind of houses than, than mine? Because when I moved in my neighborhood, I, we were the only people your age that had looked or bought a house in, in Rossville for a long time. And so I wonder if, now I see that obviously shifting and I wonder if you could speak to just to what your generation's looking for. Yeah, I, um, you know, I get, I'm so surrounded by city planners and sometimes I think, you know, I don't know exactly what the, the average person our age um, is looking for, but I see my friends in St. Louis um, who are, you know, in in the fashion industry or whatever they're doing and they all live in urban areas because it's 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 a it's affordable it's manageable and it's close to everything and um i just think you know with the recession 
we, you know, we all graduated when the recession happened, and it just, you know, I think things, I think that whole move to, to the suburbs really slowed down because we all had a hard time getting jobs, and, you know, I don't know if I can afford to have a car, you know, kind of mentality, and, and um, you know, one of the things I'm not sure about is if it's going to persist. I don't know if 10 years from now all my friends are going to move to the suburbs or not. I really don't know, but I know that... Um, I've convinced a couple people, you know, uh, my my husband had never ever considered living in a city. He thought he was going to live in Anderson Township forever. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, it took six years, but he, it, I mean, he, we bought a house in Roswell because he fell in love with it, you know. So um, I think that mentalities are changing. I just, I hope it lasts. So when he's talking to his friends in Anderson Township, what does he tell them was the, the changing point for him? What what is, he, what is he trying to convince them about when he says why he did what he did? Well, um... My wife made me do it? <laughs> <laughs> this is, what really happened was when I got a job in Hamilton, I just fell in love with Hamilton and I loved living in the mercantile lofts and just wanted to be here. And he was working at Xavier at the time and he was like, how do I trick her into getting back to Cincinnati? So he bought her, he started renting downtown because he thought he knew that I would love to live in downtown Cincinnati and he um, you know wound up realizing how amazing it was to be able to walk to everything uh, so he just he just you know really talked it up to everybody everyone loves his place and I think you know he or loved his place and um, you know he's he's he was wound up being the person that was cheerleading urban areas and then um, he got a new job and I won. <laughs> <laughs> it happens that way sometimes. Um, James, my parents, one grew up in Highland Park and the other grew up in Linnewald. And, those, and when they grew up in the 30s and 40s, those were the new subdivisions, but they were still inner spring Hamilton subdivisions. I think now those are becoming the next historic districts and they actually are totally able to be those now. To talk about Linnewald and, and what's coming for Linnewald relative to it becoming our next historic district. Um, well, like I said, I came from Indianapolis, and we were doing the same thing over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. I grew up in the suburbs of Indy, and everything was moving downtown. Everybody wanted to move downtown. Um, unfortunately, my mom is still up there, and it's pretty much a slum area right now. It's like everybody's forgetting about everything. And my wife got a job here in 2005, and I, it, it was just a different type of community because Indy was such a huge area. Everything was so far away, it wasn't close. Um, the houses were so far away. They were beautiful homes, but they had no character. And when we first saw, I, I saw the house on Benninghoff and Avenue, I fell in love with it. It had a beautiful porch. It had beautiful woodwork. I mean, these are the things you can't find in a lot of houses nowadays. I mean, everybody wants bigger, they want better, they want further away from people. Uh, one of the biggest things I wanted was a nice porch to sit on. It's close to the street, like Mike said. It's like you look at it, you look at people out there, we're, we're losing that, walking out on your porch and talk to your neighbor you know you see brandon who lives next door you're looking at all these other people out there and you're losing the social medias out there and you don't have that contact with people out there anymore it's you just don't have that connection you know that, that you should have as a neighborhood um linden wall has so many beautiful parks and it has walkable streets <laughs> the same as like a lot of the downtown is becoming now and i didn't really appreciate it till my daughter was born in 2008 once I started walking through the neighborhood, I started seeing how it used to be. I saw these old houses, and I could see, I could, you can almost picture families out there, you know, five or six kids, you know, out there having fun, you know, playing at the parks. And it, that's what I want for my daughter. And that's the reason I do what I do, to help the neighborhood grow, because I want something better for her. I think this is a beautiful community. It's like, I, all, the, all the buildings, all the people, I've met so many, you know, in the past two years, I mean, I've, I knew no one in 2011, and I met, you know, 100, 200 beautiful people out here in Hamilton that really care. There's beautiful volunteers out here. Um, we went to the volunteer recognition dinner back in April, and I was just, I was amazed at the amount of volunteers that this community has, and that what they're willing to do for the community, and how much they love their community. And that's what, that's what bonds us all together. It's the buildings, but it's the people. The people that we're losing, we're losing faith with. It's, it's, uh, it's called social capital. It is. We are stronger together than we exactly. are part of it. 
I want to be friends with my neighbors. I want to know everybody on my block. I want, I want my daughter to know everybody on her block. You know, it's, it's the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child, and it's true. When I was a kid, you know, I knew everybody around the neighborhood. I knew, and my mom and dad did too. They knew where I was at. They knew if I was in trouble, you know, they knew where to go, you know, so they knew where I was going to be. And it's, I mean, like I said, Hamilton feels like home to me. It's, it's just a beautiful community filled, filled with beautiful people, beautiful homes. This room is full of Raven fans, so I'm going to maybe start with Bob and go across the panel here. What are the biggest things we need to do collectively to, to change the tide of, because we still have a lot of empty, neglected houses. We still have a lot of holes in our urban neighborhoods. What, what can we do, all of us, not just those of you up here who are willing to be the pioneers and to buy the house in the corner where it probably shouldn't be buying it yet. You're the leading sort of bleeding edge kind of people. But what can we do as an entire group? Because our, our raving fan base is growing. And so we have more people and more resources now than we've ever had. But what's the most important thing we have to do to, to change, the, change the tide? Go ahead, give me You're a thought. You're asking me. Um, I'm asking everyone, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> after Sherry died, the, the momentum in Dayton Lane, of course, subsided considerably. It has begun to resurface, particularly on Dayton Street. Uh, young, energetic people uh, who can appreciate some of those beauty, some of that beauty that's there, uh, are starting to move into the neighborhood and and help out in, in that regard. Um, and I think we need to advertise that we exist more. Um, particularly to Oxford, to get some of those uh, Miami people over here. Um, Sherry used to have a lot of them, and they spread the word. Uh, and she had deep ties with the architecture department uh, in, in Oxford, too. And so students, architecture students, would come and help with the construction, and partly with some of the design. And uh, uh, was it Dan Becker? Dan Becker, uh, who was a uh, great help in this regard. So we need to spread the word and maybe loosen capital too. I mean, everything is tight, man. <laughs> we need some financiers to take some chances. Uh, and uh, I think that would help. I believe the, the best answer is jobs in the downtown. When I think about what's been accomplished in Over the Rhine, I believe that's happened because you are within easy striking distance of Procter & Gamble, corporate office, of the Kroger corporate office, of Fifth Third corporate office. If we create job opportunities in the downtown, I firmly believe that the historic districts will be the, the greatest beneficiary of that. I, I truly believe that we need to keep a laser focus on providing job opportunities, and I think that um, if you're within walking distance of downtown, that will, those houses will fill fast. You know, you framed it, how do we kind of change the tide? And I strongly believe that we have changed the tide already. And we have the core fund where we have this access to capital that we didn't have before to move projects forward. So we're at the very beginning, but I really see us already moving in a positive direction. And I, you know, the first thing I think of other than jobs, you know, I work in economic development. So I think jobs in the downtown is, are absolutely crucial to the vitality of just everything in our city. Um, but is a couple more really vis visual catalytic projects to have happen, especially on the high main corridor. Um, I kind of agree. I, I love to work downtown Hamilton. I'd love to not have a long drive. I'm kind of jealous of Joshua and Brandon. <laughs> and in the house, but, um, you know, look at the core of the neighborhood. I mean, it's, I think the people are finding good young people out there. I think we're losing in the cities, uh, the good young, young folk that want to move in from the colleges. I agree with that. And it's, it's people that care, you know, it's, it's people that, that care about your neighbors and care about your, your home and what you do to it. And it's, it's working together. It's, you know, we're, we're a community and that's a group of people. We can't do it by ourselves. And there's, um, when I first moved to Hamilton, there was a lot of negativity. Um, when I, when I, I came here because of my wife's job and um, when I first told the people, when I acquired a job, I first told them where I lived, they said, oh, Hamilton. 
and they made fun of me. And I was like, I didn't know what I was getting into. But once you see, you know, what Hamilton is all about, and you, you have to get past the negativity, and there's still so much negativity in this town. I think we need to get past that. I mean, you need to change people's minds and realize, you know, this is a beautiful town filled with beautiful people, and you need to, to bring young people back into this town. I mean, those are the ones that are going to be the doers as the older generation retire and, and pass on. I agree with a lot of what's already been said, but uh, I think we could do a much better job of communicating our value, and I'll use an example. I was talking to a guy who lives on <clears throat> North 10th Street in a Victorian in Dayton Lane, and I think he's from Georgia, and he works at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So I'm, I'm curious to ask this guy, and I, I do some other folks here in Hamilton who aren't from here, why, why, why did you end up here? Uh, and what this guy told me was, he was like, well, we started this process, we wanted to live in a Victorian, so we started looking in Northside, the Northside neighborhood in Cincinnati. And uh, then we went off looking at the old Millionaire's Row in West End in Cincinnati, Dayton Street. And they accidentally found Dayton Street in Hamilton, Ohio. Uh -huh. And they said, wow, how do you get that house for that amount of money? You get Northside architecture <laughs> for that amount of money. They just couldn't believe it. So this guy, uh, very confidently tells me, he said, I love Hamilton, and I love the looks on people's faces when, they, when I say that. <laughs> You've got a fan in me, buddy, so. Uh, <laughs> I, I think we've got a lot of value that we can, we can do a better job of communicating. Well, I, I agree. I always, I always think you shouldn't diss your city from your couch, and frequently people, <laughs> I think negativity is contagious, and the Hamilton thing, I think people sort of, um, for the longest time have enjoyed in a negative way so putting down Hamilton. And I, that's one of my pet peeves is people that sort of get on that track. And I think if you're, especially if you're on your couch doing that, like get up and pick up the litter in your block or something, you know? And um, I also try to be a, a commercial for Hamilton when I'm out in other areas. It's the same thing when you say you're from Hamilton and, and I always say, I know. We do actually have teeth, shoes, and bras, <laughs> and, <laughs> and you should check it out. <laughs> because whatever you, you know, people act like, you know, sometimes things on the news are not exactly positive. So I think you should be a walking commercial for your city. Um, a couple of you guys brought this up. There, there is a, um, especially Bob, there is a financial sort of, um, limitation right now to doing redevelopment. They used to be, and Sherry used to get them, they were construction loans. You could build a house, you could renovate a house, and when you were all done, they appraised the house and they, and they made it uh, this value, this appraisal, and this is the kind of loan we can give you. Yeah, right. And today, most banks will tell you there are no such things as construction loans or gap loans or bridge loans anymore. You have to get yourself to a point where we can appraise the house. I mean, Joshua found out that because his house was a commercial property before, he bought it. It wasn't going to be an appraised as a house until he completely renovated it. So he had to do that out of pocket. And that isn't something that everyone can do. I'm wondering if there's some creative tools where, and I know Joel Fink has talked about creating a pool of money that we actually do loan uh, people who are willing to be owner occupiers in a, in a downtown area, where we create a loan pool. And we do that as individuals, not as the core fund, not as First Financial Bank, but as citizens of the city of Hamilton create uh, a loan pool that allows people. Uh, to move through that system, go back and get a full-blown bank appraisal and a loan and then pay that fund back quickly. But uh, we need some of those kinds of tools uh, to figure out how to get this thing going because frankly, there's a lot of people out there that are willing to do this and they just don't have the ability to get there. The appraisal issue you bring up is, is a huge issue and something that is not always the first thing on your mind, but uh, with the values of the homes in the neighborhoods, that, that we value as a community and, and are really spectacular, um, don't stand up to the money that needs to go into them. And if you don't have that kind of liquid cash sitting around, it's, it's really difficult to do. So um, yeah, it's each of these projects, one at a time, you know, you just hope you're, you're pushing the ceiling of appraisals higher and higher and uh, making it easier for the next guy. The one of the beauties of Hamilton is our, our property values are, are not too high. That we don't, we, they're accessible to us. But that also then limits our ability to, to have banks help us uh, put, put a financial deal together. So um, I, what do people think about the idea of, I mean, I, I know Jane and Monty are actually putting money into third and fourth residences just to, to do that. 
Um, you're doing that yourself, you're financing yourself, but would, would, do you think it would be a popular thing to create a crowdfunding Kickstarter type of site where we actually ask people to contribute to the re renovation of Hamilton and, and make it an investment pool? We're not trying to give away money, we're not trying to give people gifts, we're trying to get people through a process where they can actually get to a, a, a goal in mind of having a renovated owner-occupied house in an historic district. Can we get there? You think people would do that? I would. <laughs> Maybe the Hamilton Community Foundation might be a good place. They, to they are. Oh, they are. good. That's how. All right. I hesitate to say that. But <laughs> no, they are. The rocks coming in. Yeah. Or they're they're, they're on, this on TV. It's been captured. But, uh, <laughs> I've seen. I, I'm. I'm kind of keeping track of some of those type of projects be successful in other cities. Um, the one that it's most taking off in is Washington, Washington DC, which clearly has a different uh, market than we do. But I think um, something that Hamilton really has going for it is how much passion and love a lot of people have for it. And that you can do something with a smaller pool of money. Um, those, those tools are out there and we could definitely do that and, and, and I would love to, to be a part of that. What kind of questions do the audience might have for our learned panelists? There's a, something you would like to ask or start a discussion about. Go ahead, Dan. How do we engage absentee landlords to invest in their properties when the owner occupied are investing, but it's the, the absentee landlords that are bringing the values down for the rest of us? I think you need to twist the question slightly. I think question should be how do we get the absentee landlords to release the properties to people that will actually put money back into them because by virtue of what we have already seen that the absentee landlords are not going to put money into them and I don't know if there's enough um, ability to make it financially painful enough for them to do that I think what we need to be doing is figuring out or creating an inventory of those properties and figuring out how do we capture those properties and get those properties into the hands of someone that actually wants to do something positive with it. We can't make people sell, but we can make it, I think what you were getting alluding to, is we can make it a disincentive to let the properties decay. I mean, I see these houses on, in German Village falling apart and the value that's being lost is a value they're losing. But somehow we need to, we need to make that um, an active um, penalty rather than a passive penalty where they're, they're required to do something from some kind of code, some kind of teeth in the building code that allows us to not let um, assets like that go to, uh, you know, does, into the ground. Doesn't the, does the city have a property maintenance code, and is it enforced? We do have a property maintenance code, and I do think that uh, we enforce it. I think the issue is, from a constitutional property perspective, how far can you enforce it? Um, and we do, obviously, we, we tear down several houses every single month that have fallen in, into terrible disrepair. I think what you're asking is how do we actually get to those houses? You know, what, what can we do prior to them falling in such terrible disrepair that they have to be demolished and it can actually be saved? And that's where I think for us it's, it's a little bit more difficult because I, I'll give you an example. There was a property on Dayton Lane that for probably nine years we kept going to municipal court on and it was literally falling apart and the property owner would come to court, say, well, I will put three new windows in, and the judge will say, okay, you have been... Yes. It is, it's finally gone, but, uh, but they would literally, the judge would say, okay, if you put three new windows in, you have 12 more months to work on it. So then we would have to step back because of the judge's order and wait 12 months, watch it fall further into disrepair, you know, go through the whole process again. He's like, well, I'll uh, fix a section of the roof. So it's, it's not a matter of... We would definitely enforce it in some cases we can, but a lot of times it's, it's actually court order that stops us. It's possible to delay the process longer than the house can survive. Mm -hmm. we, we did have success with one of the houses on Houston Street. I mean, it's, a, it's only one block long street. There aren't very many houses, but one of the houses, it's a 10 unit rental property that was just had gutters falling off, paint, it, it was a mess. And um, I spoke to someone from the health department and within a matter of weeks, and, and that's an absentee landlord that lives out of town, and um, within weeks, I saw people over there, and it's, it's much better, much, much better. So that, 
that made a big impact really quickly. That is something that, I don't know if you know, but the way a lot of the times it works, unless it's a really big safety hazard, you know, you gotta, you gotta be the squeaky wheel. You have to, you have to do a 311 request or something like that. Let, let the city know that's how um, our, you know, that's how we go after properties is say, look, people are complaining about these. So you're doing exactly what needs to be done. Is there a 311 line item for <laughs> property neglect? I think so. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's great. Does everyone know about 311? What's this? What's the non, like the cell phone okay number for that? And there's like my cell phone I can't call 311 from? We're actually, we're actually working on that. Um, some cities in the United States, if you dial 311, it will actually take you to a a customer service desk in the state of Ohio. We have petitioned Cincinnati Bell to be the first city in Ohio to have a 311 call in line. There's a process to get through that. Uh, we're definitely pursuing that because we get a lot of calls that actually get put over onto our 911, which we don't want to tie up our emergency operators with non emergency phone calls. I'm actually hoping in 2014 we'll, we'll have that up and running. Okay, so it's just online. Yes, the 311 is just online. Uh, the other thing is uh, the city has come out with a, an app if you do have a smartphone that it has some nuisance uh, capability to it so we can actually uh, spatially track where you take, for example, a photo from and submit it. Uh, so we do, have a, we do have an app if you have an uh, Android-based phone or an Apple-based phone. Other questions from the audience? I don't know where the microphone went. It's passing around. Go ahead. Great. Um, my concern is, I live in Dayton Lane Historical District. I've only lived here barely over a year. Um, we renovated and still are one of the houses on Dayton Street. Um, the 311 system is great if you get a response. So I'm not here to put anyone down. I get the same stigmatism, oh, you live in Hamilton. Um, you know, I clean up my block, I pick up trash, I argue with people that walk by and cause problems from other neighborhoods, but I can 311 till the cows come home and nothing happens. So, um, I know one particular property five times I have put it on 311. And there's no change. It only continues to get worse. And it's owner occupied. The one thing about 311, if you don't get an answer within 72 hours, I get an email. Um, and I do get those emails where I have a red flag. I, I'm, I'm, I, at, I'm at a loss why you've not been answered because I always I, within 72 I do hours. get an answer that they're working with the property owner, but nothing has happened with the property at all. It's only gotten worse. And that's on all three of them that I have three one month. And part of that is they're not willing to make those changes, then they have to take them through court. And that can take years, literally because they can, as Joshua described, they can extend those, those hearings on the basis of small actions that get them through the next, to the next wave. And they can literally, if you're good at it, you can put this thing down and down the road as, as far as you want. And that, that points to the need to change some of our legislation. Uh, but the 311, especially relative to city functions, when there's a light out, when there's something wrong in the city, in the city of right away, I've had tremendous success with 311. And I have with lights out and things like that, but as far as nuisance properties. Yeah. So, yeah, the ability to implore the property owner to act well, voluntarily is, if that doesn't happen, then there is a long process. Yes, Amy. Straight down, there you go. Hi, um, I've lived in an old house for most of my life. And when we, uh, we usually get by, um, referral people to have who have helped us with our home um, but even if you have the money to hire people say like well you know I know someone but I think he's dead now <laughs> or, you know like, so as far as contractors I mean who are there young people who are learning how to how to work with older homes and not just how to work with builders building new homes that's a great question there are uh, I live next door to one Todd Stidham who's fantastic with all manner of old house Renovation. Yeah, I have his phone number, please. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but you're, you point to something that would be tremendously valuable, and that would be have our own sort of Hamilton version of Angie's List for old houses. Yeah. That would yeah. be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was even thinking within the, each district, if we had mm -hmm. people, you know, right. you could just call someone and say, yeah, what do you know about my house? Or, yeah, could you help me? Yeah, that is a great how. idea. Yeah. It's nothing like a historic district project. Go ahead. At one point, Sherry uh, contacted Butler Tech people, and uh, we talked to the carpenter, the guy who was teaching carpentry, and we hired uh, one of the kids who was graduating, and he came to work for us. Uh, and he, he stayed. Uh, and that was his only job that he's ever had in his life, was wow. working for Sherry Corbin. And uh, you can find these people. We could use a clearinghouse of information of who to contact or who to talk to about this issue or that problem or this kind of plumbing problem. Do you have a plumber? Do you know a good plumber, uh, a good electrician? People who have got experience in this kind of work that's, that's special when you're doing an old house. Yeah, we had a We had a plumber come to our house and look at our old piping and looked at our old faucets and our sink and it was leaking. He said, I can't touch that, I can't help you. And he walked out the door. They just don't want to. But then we found one who just thought it was a challenge and loved it. So we have to, we have to make those lists of those people and we have to get them out there. That's a great idea. I think we've done that in Dayton Lane, haven't we? Yeah, uh-huh. Great idea. <laughs> well, we've scared them all away. <laughs> Well, I think one of the things that we don't do is compare the construction of those of these old homes versus the new construction. And you know, the, I remember when I son moved back to town from Japan, and he was looking at Westchester, and the realtor, realtors were bragging that twenty-year-old houses just had new windows and doors put into them. Yeah. And we're living in a house. We're the second owners in Highland Park, and uh, we've lived there 90 some years. We've lived there, what, <laughs> 51 <laughs> years, and we're only the second owners. But here is an 80, 90 year old house, and I've just had to replace some windows there that have lasted so much longer. And I think we don't market the town. You know, we have property that people can afford, and it, it was mentioned by you before. Uh, versus Cincinnati, uh, I, I think the marketing is lacking. And I predict you living in Lindenwall eventually will end up on the west side because that's tradition. So. <laughs> my, dad, my dad said he'd disown me if I crossed the river. So. <laughs> well, there's so many sours that you know, you never know. <laughs> Other questions, like a couple more. Yes, Brian. Uh, you mentioned that many historic homes that are not maintained are going into disrepair. And it's it's only about ten years before they're totally gone. The biggest threat to abandoned uh, or, or neglected houses is water. So, could you require the owners to at least uh, keep the roof from leaking and also cover the windows? Uh, because water is really the biggest threat to historic houses and other historic buildings. Um, if I were king for the day, I'd be right there with you, but I would think that our city legal advisors would tell us, you know, there's a thin, thin gray line there in terms of what you can require a private property owner to do their private property, but I, I wish that that were true. I, I don't know. I know there are some teeth in some codes, but I know that it's really hard to get there. And it, it's really one of our biggest problems. And so, I guess looking at it from the other side, is there a way we can be so convincing and so incentivized to just get these people to give them up? Uh, find the right price, find the right reason, uh, create the right tax structure, create the right disincentives, but just make it harder for people to own and sit in neglect houses. And if they neglect them, make it, make it d difficult financially for them. Frank. Why do they want to keep owning them? A lot of times they can continue to rent them in the condition they're in and get a modest income. Whereas if they try to renovate them to a higher market value for rental, it's, it, there's more risk there. So a lot of times um, you, can, you can keep a dilapidated house in, in creating money, creating profit. Uh, very little, but it, it's, it's in the black, and that's something that people are willing to do. Um, the, uh, a lot of the homes that you showed, Mike, are in, in uh, disrepair. 
I would assume that a lot of these people were affected negatively by the economic shutdown of the 70s and 80s with Mosler and Champion and Smart Papers again, uh, Fisher Body all shutting down. Um, and maybe they passed away by now and they're either, their estate is renting it out to someone who just doesn't care. And uh, I know when I walk around uh, the Dayton Lane area or German Village or Rossville, you see two or three nice houses and you see one that's in very much disrepair, the weeds are growing up. Um, and I know the people have brought it up here tonight. I don't know if it's whether the 311 situation where I mean, you got a homeowner, and there's only certain things that you can require of that homeowner because his name's on the deed, and there's certain uh, requirements that he has to live up to naturally. But <clears throat> I know that we're limited as a as a government to enforce certain laws, and to have this guy come out of pocket with some repairs to it. But uh, you know, I look around, I see Ohio Casualty empty, and uh, other places around here empty. And Josh brought it up about jobs, 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 and that's what it comes down to. I know I work at Fifth Third over on Red Bank, so I uh, drive a lot further than what I used to when I lived in Mason, but I love it here. I love the revitalization and the renaissance of Hamilton, but it all comes down to jobs and getting them here as opposed to people driving elsewhere. No doubt, and you're right on. I mean, it, it does take an economic environment to make our building stock more valuable and more vital, no, no doubt. I, I would observe that there's probably not as many dilapidated owner-occupied houses as you would think. Uh, there aren't many. And I've even met people who live in my neighborhood on C Street who keep their yard nice. Um, they're having trouble affording new shingles, but it's not the kind of problem house that you see where it's the absentee landlord where the grass is three feet high, there's garbage everywhere, the windows have been broken out. Um, that, that's a different problem. And again, that's the problem I think we need to disincentivize as much as we can. I, I think uh, to that point, though, the one thing that we have in our favor right now, I firmly believe, is momentum. And I'll just explain that briefly. I remember when this project was underway, um, taking some uh, prospective developers through this project. Then this project is complete. Then the Journal News building is underway. The Journal News gets complete. There's a new uh, coat of paint and some uh, aesthetic improvements going in the Robinson Schwinn building. People saw the progress. It wasn't one and done. It was you had a string of successes that you could uh, that were very tangible. Uh, the little pocket park that was just constructed at the corner of MLK and High Street, as small as, and as insignificant that it probably is, that's generated a lot of positive comments. The East High Corridor, when that gets done in 2014, uh, the City Council announced last night uh, tackling the first section of Route 4 uh, from Dayton Lane to the north, uh, down to Grand Boulevard to the south. Systematically making these type of very tangible public improvements that will get us where we need to go. And I truly, truly believe that there's going to be a tipping point when people see that. And the fact that they can find affordable housing and workforce can be available in a very uh, close proximity, that is when you'll see a lot more jobs coming to downtown Hamilton. And I truly believe that we're inching closer to that every single day. Bill, do you have a comment? Yeah. Um, um, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, they used to have a, a total 100% deduction on any improvements that you made in, in your neighborhood or on your houses, or, or, or not your homeowners, but you know, people who were in business. So that was a big incentive. At that time, a lot of doctors were buying up homes, and, and, and if you know that a lot of um, apartment buildings were being built and so forth at that, in that era. After that, the, the, the government stopped that. Now I think you don't get a very uh, substantial credit for any improvements that you make as a as a uh, businessman, but the the absentee uh, landlords is a problem. And I don't know how you solve it, <laughs> but I think like things that go on tonight help. Everybody is a little bit more aware. Of, money is the problem. You know, there's a lot of people in town that have a house or two houses, and they they're roof starts leaking, they don't have the money to fix it. I mean, they, you know, the, the rent they get doesn't, you know, you get problems just like you do in your own home. Uh, you got something wrong every month, it seems like. You got this, you know, you need your faucets fixed or you need your, something's going wrong, electric here, and all that stuff. But the, the landlords have the same problem and to keep up with it sometimes gets a little, a little hard to do. 
especially when you get to paint, you know, paint the houses and paint gets cost them forty dollars a gallon and so forth and so on. It the thing uh, the, the saw this is I think what what uh, Joshua is doing now is revitalizing all these these uh, historic districts and these districts in, in Hamilton that have gone downhill over, you know, when we lost all the businesses and so forth. So it is really a, a problem, but it can be overcome if just people persevere, and that's about what it is. Um, I don't know if that solved anything or <laughs> that, that got you a little, but it, it is a little, makes you a little more cognizant of what goes on in the, in the, in the, in the housing business. It's, it's, it's tough. And you've been doing it for a long time. Um, it's getting on seven o'clock. Go ahead, Alfred, if you want to make a comment. I, I don't want to really talk about homeowners or absentee landlords. I want to talk about business. I live downtown. You have a lot of empty small spaces next to Costas, Zettlers, on and on, and I could name 20, 25 within a four block radius. Who, either the chamber or the city, or what can we do to try to get the small business, which is what I believe will turn the downtown around, you're not going to fill up Ohio casually. What, who is working on trying to get those spaces occupied? Because to me, I mean, that's, when you walk downtown, you want to be able to walk somewhere. Where do you walk now? Not too many places. So I'm curious about what we're doing with those small spaces. Well, and there are a lot of people working a lot of ways. And we have new businesses coming on all the time, but then, you know, we lose them too. Um, it's a chicken and egg theory. We need the, the residential density in downtown. We need the jobs downtown and the small businesses take care of themselves. When Ohio Cashew was full, all the small businesses were thriving. When Ohio... <coughs> yes, absolutely. Since I've been here, the corner's been empty for over a year. Costas has been empty for two years. My point years. is, they were all full when Ohio Casualty was at, at full to speak. Ohio I know. All I'm saying is there's a relationship between the big companies and jobs and the little small businesses, the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers. They need a thriving economic environment to be a successful business. Since we're not going to get Ohio Casualty back, who is working on those small businesses? Well, let, me, let me take a stab at this. I, I think that what you just said captures the essence of why the core fund was created. We recognized that the, the big businesses were much less likely to happen and that the foundation of any downtown business growth was going to be what you said. It's going to be small business. And I agree with you 100%. Uh, that is why we're used to have large buildings with single occupants. You now have large buildings that are going to have multiple occupants. And the core fund was created to provide that gap financing because that right now is the probably the largest hurdle to get over is the, uh, the equity to get into a project. I believe that uh, you have examples of that happening right now, and you look at a life ray that's in the Robinson Schwinn building, a uh, Lane Library Tech Center that's in the Robinson Schwinn building, uh, a new attorney's office just opened up uh, Monday this week on the fourth floor of the Robinson Schwinn building. By parceling off those small buildings and by uh, using the form-based codes that were passed by city council in the last 12 months, you're gonna make it much easier uh, to allow the small businesses to get in and to have that, um, that gap financing opportunity through the core fund. And really, you bring up a good point. It's the one thing that I think that in the last maybe 18 months, Hamilton's done a better job of, which is we all had strengths in certain areas, being the Hamilton Community Foundation, being the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, the city of Hamilton, now the core fund. We actually meet every single Friday with, the, with a laser focus on what you just said. How do we drive jobs and ultimately residents back into the core area and it's gonna take a combination of all those entities, um, and frankly, just owning the real estate makes it easier, and that's why the core fund has really focused on that in the last maybe three months, but now it's going to start, in my mind, I'll let Mike speak to that, start transitioning to how do we get the real estate into the hands of someone that can start creating those, those jobs. That's, that's a great place to stop. That's fantastic, Joshua. We're lucky to have you. Um, I wanna continue this conversation. We're not ready to leave, but I think we're all ready to get up out of our seats and move around a little. I want to let Karen uh, Whalen have the last word. She's the president of Historic Hamilton and the organization that put this on tonight. So we want to thank you first and then let you have the last word.
you, the panel. This has been a very interesting and informative evening, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it, and I've learned a lot. And as a native Hamiltonian, I can only say I've, I've never been prouder than I am today at the progress that's going on in this community. We had some hard times, but it's really exciting. The momentum is, is great. So thanks to all that have a part in all of that. Um, very quickly, I just want to thank the Historic Hamilton Board. They've been wonderful, real troopers. And in particular, our committee, Cindy Dingledine, uh, Mary Pat Essman, and Tyree, and Sonia August. They worked really hard uh, to put this on tonight. So thank you to all of you. coming out and filming this. Um, it's a great opportunity to let more people know about Historic Hamilton and all the things we're doing in the community. So, um, and now our favorite time, refreshments. Go and enjoy. Thank you for coming. <laughs>